Thank you, Dr. Dave. That was wonderful. We are going to uh, spend 30 minutes in a Q&A with all three of our future speakers. So joining me up on stage will be uh, Matthew Leonard, Dr. Dave Andrews, and Father Donald Calloway. So we have a wide range of questions. The first one here is, and for any of our speakers, we're starting a new men's group at our parish, St. Mark's, in Plano. What are your two best pieces of advice for us? P.S. The group is based on your consecration of St. Joseph book, so make them good. So two best, two best pieces of advice from each of you for starting a men's parish based group at their church. Well, that's great. I think I met that gentleman uh, here. Uh, at least one of them associated with it. That's awesome, great. So you've already got St. Joseph covered, so that's great, so that won't be one of the two then. I would say prayer, as brothers, for sure. And um, with Joseph, you need to have Our Lady. So bring in the Marian devotion, whatever form that takes, whether it's rosary or whatever it is. Uh, so for me, prayer and Our Lady. I was in St. Mark's uh, last June at a conference, so I would say this is going to sound a little bit different. First of all, I echo Father. Prayer is number one. But I'd also say, based on my experience as a Protestant growing up, while a men's group is great, you want to have sharing and, and camaraderie, and you want to be real with each other, I would also say be careful not to let the sharing take the replace the sacrament of confession. Uh, you need to confess those sins to a priest. And the Roman Brotherhood, don't, don't swap out with this guy and that guy. Keep a core together as you grow together because I think that's the way that you build union and community with everybody. But don't let it replace the sacrament confession. Get it out of there. They both said prayer, so I will say that. Uh, honesty and empathy. So there you go. So uh, all the best, St. Mark's. Uh, you've got a, a wonderful parish, a wonderful uh, group of priests led by Father Cargo. So um, you've got some great advice. Next question. The Eucharist makes Jesus physically present, but in what way is Calvary specifically present to us during the Mass? Thank you. If I can qualify the question, the Church does not teach that Jesus is physically present in the Eucharist, but the Church teaches that Christ is substantially present in the Eucharist. And that the difference is substantive, right? It makes a difference because substance is not quantity, color, shape, smell, all of the accidents of physical presence are absent from the Eucharist. You know, uh, touching, taste, and seeing are indeed deceived. St. Thomas writes in the Doritae. It's only substance that's present. Now, Matthew chuckled when he heard this question, because this is a kind of a pet peeve of mine. I would like to tell you what the Church's traditional teaching is on the relationship of Calvary to the Mass. And I emphasize the word traditional because it's been forgotten in recent years and a new theory has come to replace it that is not dogmatic teaching. The traditional teaching on the relationship between Calvary and the Mass is that the Mass contains the same victim. Christ who died in Calvary is also present in the Mass. The same priest is present. The one who offered himself in Calvary offers himself in the Mass through the intention of the ministerial priest. And it's for the same intent, namely the reconciliation of the world with God. But the manner of the offering is different. Calvary was an unbloody offering, and the Mass is, excuse me, Calvary is a bloody offering, and the Mass is an unbloody offering. And uh, St. Thomas also remarks that we call the Eucharist a sacrifice in an analogous way, in the same way he says that we call a picture of Cicero, Cicero. And so Calvary and the Mass are numerically distinct offerings. They're specifically the same, but they're numerically the same. Each Mass is itself a unique propitiation that can be offered for a particular intention. Right? That's the traditional teaching of the Church. Now, there's a, a new theory that has come in that suggests that Calvary and the Mass are numerically identical, and that by going to Mass, you somehow are mystically translated 2,000 years back in time and find yourself at the foot of the cross with, with the Marys. Right? And that idea actually is important from Calvinism. It's not a Catholic idea. It comes from the Reformed tradition, from the Protestant tradition. And the reason I want to make the distinction to point it out to you is that people, devotionalists, who hold that view of the Mass, appropriate the Mass 
in an attitude of passivity like Calvinists would and think that the purpose of the thing is to see myself there at the foot of the cross in wonder at Jesus' sacrifice. But they never get around to the element of self-offering. Right? That's why I made the point in my own talk that the, the, our appropriation of the Mass requires us to understand that what we are doing here and now is a distinct oblation that we are offering ourselves along with Jesus now. It's not merely a bit except gazing at Jesus. It's actually entering into, entering into his act of, of self-oblation. Thank you. Anything that you care to add or, or, or no thought or anything? No, I mean, you're so smart, I'm, I'm intimidated by your knowledge. I'm listening to them. Oh, 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 yeah. yeah um, I do remember that when I converted to Catholicism, um, I remember thinking to myself, he's physically there, right, this whole question, and I thought, is he like smashed in the tabernacle, you know, is he, is he like doing some kind of yoga position up in the tabernacle, because I didn't understand it correctly, but what you're saying, it makes so much sense, you yeah. know. When you understand it that way, sorry, Tom, when you understand it that way, it helps you to, to, to piggyback on what Dan was saying. We're supposed to be looking at sacrifices, right? We're liturgizing in the pew at the same time the priest is liturgizing behind the altar. That's the proper way to understand what's taking place. And so it kind of gets rid of this power struggle between people and the priest and who gets to do what. We're all participating in this one sacrifice of the Mass. And when you start to see it through that lens, all of a sudden, Mass takes on a completely different meaning for you in the pew. Because again, you're not just receiving the Eucharist, you are giving yourself, and you can't become like Jesus Christ until you learn to give of yourself like the three members of the Trinity. Thank you. Our next question says, my sister has recently stopped practicing her faith and left the church because she disagrees on the church's stance on people who are gay, lesbian, and transgender. How do I go about encouraging my sister to redevelop her faith and practice Catholicism. Well, I mean, this is quite common today. I have many family members that are in a similar situation. There's not many Catholics in my family, but many people have turned away from Christianity, I think, in general, because of the same idea. Obviously, one, we want to love them. God loves them. They're persons. Um, we have to stand our ground with the truth, but you know, sometimes you have to pick your battles, you have to know what to say, when to say it, how to say it. Always with love. You know, a lot of times people, when they hear me talk, I'm more of a preacher than a teacher. So sometimes they're like, Father, you do love us, right? And I'm like, yeah, I'm like, sorry if that didn't come through. Um, you know, <laughs> sometimes I just want to give a spanking and I got to remind you, oh yeah, I'm good, it's because I love you, kid, you know. Um, so always with love, with great mercy, compassion, and empathy. We're all sinners, we've all got to cross the ferry. And I think that just continuing the relationship, you don't want to abandon people, you don't want to, you know, cut off the relationship. Um, but obviously there's certain limits and restrictions, you know, if it's your house, well, there's your rules and such. Love, I think, true love, not the worldly love, true love always overcomes these things. It takes time, they may hate you for a time, they may think that you're a homophobe and you're out to get them. That's not true, you know that's not true. Um, just love to it hurts in this situation, and it will hurt, it will hurt. Well, let me piggyback on that with regard to the hurting. And, you know, I, I mentioned, I think, briefly in the talk about how we're a union of body and soul. And as Catholics, sometimes we feel powerless and we are confronted with the, the sin that we see in other people's lives, or, and we just don't know what to do about it if someone leaves the church. It's not just with these giant problems, it's just, as I said, we all have people that have left the church in our lives. We have a very powerful weapon at our disposal. And we tell people all the time, pray, 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 pray. We have to pray, right? We pray for these people. But take it another step. And don't just pray for these people. Offer your body in penance for that person you love. Because when you offer your own body up for them, you're doing exactly what Jesus Christ did for us. And it takes your prayer life and it puts it on steroids. And this is what, you know, like what Father says, love till it hurts. Make a gift of yourself. We're all united in the body of Christ. We have the power of the will through the power of Jesus Christ and his cross. So wield it. And will it hurt? Yeah. Offer yourself up for them. That's the love of Jesus Christ. And it, 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 it will, everyone's got their own free will. There's no silver bullet, guys. 
You can't just say, I'm going to do this, and presto, that person's going to get you know, back in the church. It doesn't work like that, because we all have free will. But you do have things at your disposal. It will be an inconvenience, and it will hurt. It doesn't have to be crazy. You don't have to put on a hair shirt and go live in a cave and you know, beat yourself with discipline or whatever. Make little things. Skip a meal a week. Don't use butter. Like I mentioned some of them earlier, like, turn the hot water out the end of your shower. Say a Hail Mary. Offer your own self up for them because it, it widens the channel of grace that flows. Uh, I have a son that I love very much. He said to me one time, Danny, you are always right about everything, and nobody cares. <laughs> Before I was Catholic, my whole orientation in life as a Christian, because I believed in the Protestant doctrine of salvation by faith alone, I thought the most important thing I could, I could do would be to persuade people to believe the faith through any means necessary. And for me, that was an intellectual way, it was to master Christian theology and become an apologist. That didn't turn out so well for me, by the way. I ended up leaving the tradition that I was apologizing for. Um, but I remember once I had a debate with a relative, and this particular one was about the reliability of the New Testament manuscripts. That's what we were arguing about. And I had just committed almost to memory F.F. F. Bruce's book, The Reliability of the New Testament Manuscripts. I had all the arguments worked out in my head. And this guy wasn't a theologian, and I just wiped the floor with him. I mean, I demolished him on this particular topic. And I sat back in a self-satisfied way. I don't know what I expected him to say, but it wasn't this. He said, but David, I don't like Christians. And I thought, me neither. Not that much. You know? What do you do with that? What do you do with that? And uh, when I was still a Protestant, I discovered this diminutive Catholic nun named Mother Teresa. And I read a story about her that made a profound impression on me, it still did. Because again, think from my point of view as a Protestant, the most important thing I could do in the world would be to get people to profess the faith as I understood it. And we would, believe it or not, we would actually have a kind of glee at other people's suffering, kind of schadenfreude, if we thought it could quote unquote lead them to conversion. A genuine happiness, in like another person's trials, thinking, oh, maybe this is what God will use to bring them around to see the right point of view. And getting them to seal the deal, like that was the important thing. And I read this story about Mother Teresa, where she was, of course, ministering to the dying in Calcutta, and she found this woman who was lying in the gutter being eaten by ants as she was dying. So she takes this Hindu woman, and she brings her back to her home from dying, cleans her up, dresses her, pays her wings, and it's literally nursing her to death. And, you know, as an evangelical, I was like, okay, now you got her where you are. This is the time to lay the four spiritual walls on her. This is when you, you know, you, you, you try to coerce her into making an act of faith and inviting Jesus into her life. And yet, Mother Teresa didn't do that. What she did instead was she let the woman talk. And she opened up her life. And the worst suffering she had wasn't her, her mortality, it wasn't her dying. It was the fact that her son had abandoned her and she was filled with bitterness and anger. And through her own love and charity, Mother Teresa brought this woman to the point of saying, I forgive my son. In other words, she helped elicit a moral transformation in the woman, not a religious conversion. And that was the end of the story, and the woman died. And as an evangelical Protestant, I was kind of first aghast because I thought, well, you blew your opportunity. Like, who cares if she gives, forgives her song? What she needs to do is invite Jesus into her heart. <laughs> and, uh, but, I, I, but then I was convicted. And experiences like the one I had with the fellow and the debate and others led me to see how my own profound need to always be right, to always have an answer and be able to best someone in debate, made me into a really obnoxious person. And I realized that I tolerated in myself behaviors with respect to religion, that I wouldn't tolerate in any other realm of human endeavor, be it politics or sports or whatnot. Religion was making me a really bad man, I guess. And, uh, and I saw in the person of Mother Teresa a completely different way to think about the goals of religious life and the, the tools of evangelism, as opposed to proselytism. 
And today, I'm only more confirmed in this conviction that, that with most people, uh, we are not going to win them through argument. But, but we have to show them that Christians are people that they don't have to dislike. And that we can lead with charity and by the transformation of our own lives. Um, and so that's what I always advise people when they have these situations with their relatives. Like, you know, they may never convert. They may never come back around. But they sure as heck aren't going to do it just because you're right. Nobody ever becomes a Catholic because they lose. It's a relationship, and David mentioned this in his talk, and we think about it in terms of our relationship with Jesus Christ. Like we know that we grow in relationship, we move to deeper union with Him. That manifests itself to other people, non-Christians or people who reject the church, through us. And so our own relationship with that person is the conduit through which their relationship with Jesus Christ then grows. So it's all about relationship, and we're, we're walking with them until they get to that point that they can actually then engage with the Lord themselves uh, in, a, in a cognitive way. So it's on us. We are the evangelists. And what that means for us is we have to be evangelized ourselves. St. Bernard of Clairvaux says you have to be filled to the brim like a reservoir. Because we think it's standing on the street corners and, you know, shouting about the church and we got to know all of our arguments, etc., etc., etc. No, it's being a vessel of the Spirit. And being that reservoir that's filled to the brim so that the Holy Spirit, you're so full of the Holy Spirit, that He overflows out of you and waters the, the fields around you so that your own capacity does not diminish. That's how you become an evangelizer, and that's how you get the love that these guys are talking about that's going to draw people in from the life of sin. We have the market corner again, guys. We, everybody wants what we have, even if they don't know it. And we show that by our joy and our love while maintaining the line of truth. But you have to have that joy and that love, otherwise forget about it. Anyone who's a convert knows this is how you come into the church, just through your relationship of love with other people who guide you in. And that's what we have to do with others. Given the theme of our conference, Encountering Jesus Eucharistic Revival, this question is so ever fitting. And it is today, many Catholics do not believe in the true presence during Mass. What can we do to believe and take this seriously? So, I'm maybe the odd man out here, right? Because I think there are a number of people who know the Church's teaching on the true presence and reject it because they haven't found it to be transformative. And so I'm skeptical of the efficacy of simply pounding the table and saying true presence in a louder voice. I think that we have to help people, we ourselves need to encounter our Eucharistic Lord in a transformative way, which means that the Eucharist cannot be abstracted from the larger question of Christian life and relationship with Christ. We have to go about the disciplines of the spiritual life and be transformed internally. We have to purify ourselves of sin. We have to be illumined in our understanding and be able to find Christ in the persons of our hated ideological enemies. We have to uh, be parishes with, that people feel welcome and accepted when they come here and they can sense the love of Christ. Well, see, the biggest problem that converts have, especially Protestant converts to Catholicism, is they enter the Catholic parish and they feel profoundly lonely. And there's a structural and historical problem and a cultural problem with, with Catholic life where that is a pervasive issue, right? And, uh, you know, Simply telling people Christ is really present in the Blessed Sacrament will ultimately fall on deaf ears unless they see how that makes a concrete difference in our ethical, moral, spiritual, social lives. And the only way that's going to happen is if you start to take, and I start to take the Eucharist more seriously. How much time do we spend during the week? Let's just assume for a second you're only going to Sunday Mass. How much time during the week are we preparing for that encounter with the God of the universe? Are we spending the time in prayer? And for that matter, 
Are you going to daily mass if it's offered? Because if you don't, you're crazy. I mean, seriously. The God of the universe makes himself available to us, and we have an opportunity to go, and we don't. And I realized I got legged up. I mean, Father and I live in Steubenville. There's like, you know, there are multiple masses on a daily basis that I can get my family to. And let me just say, if we, we go to the mass of the family, we're not always at the same masses because schedules and all that, and I don't always hear angels singing when I take my kids to mass. Trust me. It is not beautiful a lot of times. But we go, and we order our lives around it. And one of the reasons we do that is to show our children that this is what our lives are supposed to be ordered around. Even when we go on vacation, we're going to daily mass. And doing that and preparing for the Eucharist is what makes it real in our own hearts. So it does what David's talking about, and it makes it a reality in the way that we live our lives. That then attracts people like moths to the flame. You have to have that living fire of love. But if you don't take the Eucharist really seriously and order your life around it, why are we expecting other people to think it's the real presence of Jesus Christ? It's a simple question. Yeah, from my perspective as a priest, I would say, um, so maybe two perspectives. One, for me and my brother priest, a lot of the burden of this is on us because you call us father for a reason. So you are like children to us. And children look to their father and they want to imitate him. What they see him do, they, they imitate, they do. So we need to be reverent during the celebration of events. Because when we're not, uh, the likelihood of you not being reverent is gonna be duplicated in a thousand souls. So you need to see us being reverent in the way that we celebrate Mass. In the, in the dignified way that we do it. I think a lot of these things could be resolved if we return to a lot of the practices that were ditched in previous, you know, times, or were done in previous times that have been ditched recently. Now, that doesn't mean we're going back to the 13th century. I'm not advocating that. But there's some key things that could be done that could make a return to reverence um, that are is simple, so simple. I mean, I'm all about the Eucharistic Revival. That's, I, that's fantastic. But to me, I mean, tabernacle placement is key, for example. I think it should be right there, right? I think that's kind of, for me, pretty basic. And so those kind of things happen. We can have committee meetings and strategic planning programs and spend like a billion dollars on congresses and such. But this is something that just takes two men to move. You know what I mean? It's not, it's not rocket science. So there's a lot of things like that. Then there's a lot of other, other issues when it comes to the, the relationship between confession and the Eucharist. As from a priest's perspective, I try to be reverent, right? But it, it, it's, it, it's fascinating to me how, many, how long the lines are for communion and how short the lines are for confession. A lot of people are not realizing the gravity of sin and we're not seeing this example given, even sometimes by the leaders. The Holy Communion is given to people who publicly profess to be Catholic, and yet they are so far from being Catholic. You know what I'm talking about. Until those things are rectified and corrected, and children get spanked. Sorry, I always harp on that, but it's true, right? Because until those things are corrected, you can give all the theology you want. But when the, the lived example is, it really doesn't mean anything to even the leaders that they give it, so to speak, to the dogs, remember even Jesus used these words, then how seriously are you taking it? The clergy, the leaders, the commanders of the army, right? So there's so many, I could go on, I'm writing a book about the Eucharistic Bible right now, and some of these things will be in it. We have an opportunity right now in the Catholic Church to shine and to, to make some corrections in these areas. But my concern is that we're just gonna have meetings and workshops and we're gonna dance around the real issues and the, the Eucharist Revival is gonna come and go and a lot of the stuff, there's, the corrections that could be made are not gonna be made. And that's, that's my concern. And I, I would ask you to pray for that because right now I think the Holy Spirit is really wanting to do something powerful to bring this true revival around. Remember, it's not the Eucharist that needs a revival, it's us. It's us who need the revival. And that's only gonna come about through preaching, through example, through love. 
And when those things are working together in the sanctuary and in the pews, bam, you got your revival right there. That's my perspective. Amen. We have time for one more question, and there were several here that all take it a little bit further in terms of what fathers can do with their children, so I'll try to synthesize several to this one question. Uh, but this particular one begins, I miss the opportunity to lead my family in prayer and religious activity when my children were young. I've taken a more active role now in prayer and the church, but my children are older now and have left the faith. Is there more I can do now that they're gone and outside of the home? There is a Catholic author that I would recommend to everyone by the name of James Stinson. And he was a headmaster at an independent private Catholic school for many years. And he noticed that there were families that thrived succeeded and there are families that fell apart and whose children did not do well. And he decided to make a study of what led to successful families and uh, you know, compiled over many decades and he published his findings in a number of books. And the essential core of what he found was that the successful families had a sense of adventure and, and, and identity as a family. And they, they engaged in practices that were occasions to develop the virtues. And I'm not talking specifically about religious practices. For example, he found that the children of entrepreneurs tended to do better than the children of professionals because they were more likely to work with their fathers and to see their parents exercise the virtues. And I'm a parent of five and a grandparent of two, and I have children that are closer and farther uh, from the church and have done better and worse in their own moral lives. And in my experience, there is no one-to-one -one correlation between the amount of explicitly religious activity that I attempt to voice upon them and their moral response. Uh, and in some, time, in some cases, the, the relationship was actually negatively correlated. Uh, you know, when my approach was, I'm going to make sure you understand the doctrinal content and you undergo the rituals. Uh, but, you know, perhaps my own moral example was not as robust, but my relationship was not as open and as honest. Those children may have more content knowledge of the faith, but they are less likely to be close to the heart of the church in terms of practice. And, uh, and so I. I try to emphasize this in my talk, but ultimately I think the, the heart of the Christian faith is that we have to have an interior transformation that leads us into the practice of the virtues. And that is what we'll catch, that is what communicates. And uh, many people have had the experience of growing up in, in you know, dogmatic and strict homes where they felt like the faith was thrust upon them and they rebel against it. You have to have that relationship, there has to be charity, there has to be trust, there has to be goodwill. Uh, and ultimately has to be practice the virtues because if you don't have temperance and justice uh, and prudence, um, you're not going to have what you need to sustain a, a life of religious practice in this world that we live in. And not to beat a dead horse, if you don't have a life of prayer, you're done. You, and you have to not live it in secret as well. Uh, my kids know that I have six kids, so the only way I'm going to get any time with the Lord is if I'm waking up before the sun comes up. And it's not always easy, trust me. It's hard to get up and to get down there in the morning and that's the only quiet time that I get. But my kids know that I do this every day. And I remember coming home uh, from work one time and there was one of these little worksheets on the couch that my, I don't know, third grade daughter had, had written on. It was one of these kind of fill in the blank things. And the fill in the blank thing was, my blank is my hero because and she wrote in, my dad is my hero because he prays. And so she saw me, I, I had no idea she was even watching, right? But she saw that I was trying at least to live this relationship out with the Lord in prayer. And it was this lived example for her. And again, you know, to David's point, if I'm still a giant jerk, it's not gonna matter. 
But what's supposed to happen is that life of prayer is supposed to actually transform me and restore that lost likeness to, to God that Adam lost back in the garden. The Catechism says this prayer restores man to God's likeness and enables him to share in the power of God's love. And that's how you continue to work in your kid's life. If your kids have already flown the coop and they're not outside of the church, it doesn't mean you're powerless. I'll go back again to what I said before. Start offering yourself up for them in penance. It's way more powerful than you realize. The graces that are at our disposal, guys, are so powerful. There's enough grace in one consecrated host to save the entire world. And the only thing stopping it is us. Prayer is what gets us out of the way so that grace can have its maximum impact upon our lives and we can be that channel of grace for the other people in our lives. But they have to see that love and that virtue growing inside of you. Otherwise, like, what's the point? And I say all of this with a grain of salt. Take everything I say with a grain of salt because my oldest kid's 20 years old. My youngest is five. Don't read a, a kid's, you know, raising kid's book from someone who's got a six-month-old, okay? Pick and choose the people you listen to. And, and there's no silver bullet. Again, if you don't feel like a failure because one of your kids has left the day, they have a free will. You do what you can do and realize, too, that the conversion that takes place is by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not by you being perfect. You strive for that perfection, but it's, your success is in the Holy Spirit. Yeah, again, I guess from my perspective as a priest, now a priest for 20 years, I hear this a lot, this particular question. Father, when we were young, in our marriage, we really jumped it up. We did not live a virtuous marriage. We did not live a prayerful example. Um, and now our children are out of the house, and we've had conversions, we've had reversions. We've fallen in love, we're going to daily mass now. We get it, we understand that. But what about our kids? They're not under our roof anymore. They don't have to observe our rules. They have free will, right? So just the frank truth here, you may not be able to do much other than this, and this is powerful. Suffer. That may be your cross. What you don't want to do is deny that you jacked it up. You screwed it up. Because a lot of people come and they think, but Father, we sent them to Catholic school. Well, that's good. Sadly, most Catholic schools today suck. <laughs> Unless you, you, you vet. Those teachers, you may have, you know, Sister Social Justice, who's more concerned about trees and, you know, ecology and whatnot, and not really teaching them the substance of the faith. So you were forking out money for their education, and that may seem good, because I, I, I have people come to me as well, and, and they'll say, Father, we did everything right. We sent them to Notre Dame. But the kids know more about football than they do at Notre Dame. They are late, right? And you may not be able to do much once they're outside of your house. But what you can do is more than you can do because you can unite your suffering, a form of carrying the cross as a parent to those grown up children that is gonna crucify you. It's gonna hurt. Because now what you have, you realize they don't have and you're gonna see it. And there's gonna be times you're gonna, you know, maybe make the mistake of wanting to ram the catechism down their throat at Thanksgiving. That's not gonna work, obviously. You're going to have to suffer through watching them go through years of unhappiness and searching in all the wrong places while you know now, you know where it's found, but they don't. And that's a heavy cross. How many moms and dads I now talk to as a priest that share this with me? But you know what? You've got a pulse, you've got hope. You can make those sacrifices, do penance, mortification, carry that cross. That is your cross to carry. Carry it. And it, it will force you down. You will fall many times, just like our Lord did walking to Calvary. It, it's going to take you to your passion. But it's going to be for your own benefit to make reparation for you jacking it up. Because maybe you did. Say it like, call it by its name. You jacked it up. Carry that cross now, make mortification for your own faults, and united with Christ now, your sufferings can be beneficial for them in God's time. I mean, you, you think about, you know, Monica and St. Augustine, right? Wow, how many tears, how many tears. 
And then when God's time comes, it's as though Monica put up a bucket. God said, now's the time. Boom! And Augustine has such an amazing conversion. Pray for it. May, may take longer than you expect. I always like to tell mothers in particular, us men, we deal with it differently. You know, we go through this and men are like, yeah, 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 don't come around, honey, don't worry about it. <laughs> you know? We're a little detached emotionally from these things sometimes. Women are, you know, because we lived in their body for nine years. And I always tell women, look, you suffered through morning sickness. You were vomiting. You were having cramps and all kind of stuff for nine months. It was torturous. But you saw the birth of that child through the pain. And through all that. And then when you held that baby in your arms, all that was forgotten. You were smothering that child with kisses. Well, give, help me to give spiritual birth to a child could take nine years, 19 years, 29 years. That's just how it is. So be willing to do that, brothers, here, if you jacked it up in the past. It's not too late. But now you have a different form of a cross to carry. Carry it bravely and boldly and never give up. As long as you have a pulse, you have hope. And allow yourself to be crucified with Christ for the salvation of your children. Those who uh, asked us questions, those are fabulous, and uh, it was very practical. It was wonderful. 